All right. Well, thanks, Chris. I don't know. I don't know if I'm a guru or a, maybe maybe a guru, but but let me uh, let me start off. Um, I'm Reg. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Nice to meet you. Allow me a moment to share a little bit of my testimony. Um, I was on the bottle for a long time, even behind bars for a while. Some of you probably don't realize that, but constantly mooched off my mom and struggled to get along with most people. And honestly, I threw a fit a lot because I didn't get my way and was often sitting in some really deep poo. But finally, I climbed out of my way, or climbed out, and one day I fell out of my crib. Some of you will take a little while to process that. So, so we're, we're not in an AA meeting like Pastor Chris referenced when we spoke two weeks ago when sharing his heart for the church, but allow me to be vulnerable and share a little bit of my story. Admittedly, this is not one of those sermons that could be summed up in 30 seconds. It really is all about relationships. Or it could easily turn into its own series and training, but since I'm a pastor at heart, I'll try to find some middle ground, probably around four hours. <laughs> Actually, Esther threatened me with launch if I went over the allotted time, so if the Spirit doesn't lead, my stomach might. But I would ask you to send me a little of grace as this message has really kind of expanded and shrunk and gotten bigger with bigger ideas and smaller ideas and created a lot more questions in a lot of ways for us. Ultimately, it really is more about a way of thinking relationally in ministry. So I think today is going to be a fun ride and potentially a little emotional for me too, as I can get pretty passionate about this topic. Pray also that I, uh, I adjust to using this computer and glasses and staying put in one spot. I'm not used to staying put in one spot, so that's a challenge for me. But seriously though, back to my story, besides my rocky start in the crib, I've been a believer since age four. I still remember the time sitting outside on a hot day with my mom, talking about heaven and talking about hell and, and choosing Jesus and heaven. It sounded like a better option. Um, in the midst of my spiritual beginnings, I actually did grow up with an alcoholic mom who sobered up when I was around eight. And it's been a journey of healing and transformation for the whole family. In middle school, I had a new youth pastor who came and heavily invested in me and began um, ministry training, even in high school, and honestly, I've been in ministry in some form or fashion ever since. Um, going through college and grad school and pursuing a passion for youth ministry. It was exciting times. God was doing some really cool stuff, and really at that point I had life all planned out and completely figured out. And then things always change. After schooling and internships in Chicago, we moved back to Emporia, um, I was convinced to take on a position of a middle school, high school, and college ministry there. During our time there, we came up with the name, or the youth group came up with the name Shelter during a bad storm one night. But it was actually an acronym for sharing his eternal love to every race. Our college group, oddly enough, came up with a name as well. They chose the name Theophilus because we were we were going through the book of Acts and they liked the idea and the meaning of it and it sounds like some sort of Greek organization. And so, as you can see, Theophilus means lover of God. And these were some really fun times in many ways and we had a really diverse group. And if you take a look, you can see that God was doing some really cool things and it was really interesting to me um, sometimes when the slides work. But... Um, <laughs> God, God is about diversity, and that's one of the things that really um, is, a, is a passion of mine, that I'm fascinated when different gifts, personal, personalities, and backgrounds come together. And that, that well, that's, that's part of it, but that's, let's go back a slide there. Um, that's not my college group. I mean, it, it'd be fun if it was, but... So I don't, I don't know, we'll, we'll eventually get to the college group picture because it, it actually has some fun things. Um, the one thing about our college ministry, though, is really racially diverse, and eventually you'll see it. But, um, but what was really cool about it is that there are some really funny stories of learning about God's diversity among us. And honestly, I'm still learning about some of the systemic issues that plague our country. 
But I still love them as dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and really, and honestly, and still in contact with several of them today. Um, it's, it's kind of a really a cool thing. So I don't know if we're ever going to get to those or not. But it didn't translate over for some reason. It didn't? It was there earlier. Oh, well. Well, I'll show you that picture at some point, I guess. Um, it was what it was. So, however, however, not all has been fun in life and ministry. Um, honestly, about the same time that all that was transpiring, within a year, my dad died, and I was only 26. Within that same 18-month window, my, all my grandparents died. And on top of that, I developed brain tumors and lost my hearing completely on my left side. And on top of that, my youngest son was born with a host of medical issues forcing us to spend a lot of time at Children's Mercy, which is how God led us to the KC area and to a church where I served for 14 exciting years. It eventually came time to leave the church, which was confusing and honestly very heartbreaking and super hard. And I spent a lot of time wondering what God had next. And then, on top of that same time time, my wife wanted a divorce. No matter how hard I tried to reconcile and save it, it was not meant to be. I'm not really going to get into the specifics now as I don't know that that would be beneficial. But we all know that relationships are two-way streets and take a lot of work. I wish I had loved her better, and I wish that it wasn't part of my story, but it is. And now I continue to work at learning, changing, and moving forward. Yet I know that God is faithful and works through it all and never leaves us. God has extended His mercy and grace through Chris and Esther to be a giant blessing to me and allowed me to live with them and their family as the finances of the divorce finalize and as I process, heal, and listen for what's next. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm super thankful for them and their kids, too, and now have all kinds of sermon illustrations to share. <laughs> Yet... The real story is this isn't about me. Today it's about us. And we all have a story. And we all struggle. And as we continue to move forward together, God continues to draw, guide, grow, and use us as this journey continues. One of my favorite books, now we'll get to the slide, or movies, is Lord of the Rings. This is not my college group. This is actually one of my favorite books and stories. Um, because of the story of individuals in a group being guided through transformation, deep friendship, hard struggles, and movement towards something, toward making this world better. So as we continue our walk through the book of Acts, let's recap a little bit of what Pastor Chris has shared already. In Acts 1.6, you may remember that he began with the idea of movement and how the 12 disciples moved from spectators to movers, and that Jesus needed to leave His disciples because they would likely have stuck with Him and never left the nest. I've kind of been wondering ever since, how are we advancing the kingdom in light of eternity through the various ways He's wired us and all our various unique giftings? We were made for movement. We were made to do something constructive. That brings us a little closer to this week, and Pastor Chris asked me to share this week's message because I'm a bit of a big picture strategic thinker and love the idea of mobilizing people and their unique personalities and giftedness to change a community and beyond. I'm a bit of an idealist. I like to think of the possibilities when God is on the move. So let's take a moment and let's look at Acts 2. Um, as you'll see here in Acts 2, in verse 42 to 47 in particular, and you can follow along um, in your Bible or on your phone, or if you want to follow along on the screen, that's cool too. But it says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and great generosity. 
all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I don't know about you, but when I read that passage, it almost gives me goosebumps thinking of the possibilities. Because they began their journey by studying Scripture. They prayed a lot. And as Chris alluded to, sometimes it seems like they got to the point where they just flipped a coin and trying to discern what God's will is. And since this was new territory, like, how do you proceed in this? This last month has been graduation season, and students and parents are often wrestling with the big questions of like, what's God's will for my life? And I don't have a lot of specific answers to that. And I don't know that God specifically does either, but He does make abundantly clear a few things. What was His greatest command? And let's follow along. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. When faced with a trial lawyer basically coming to try to stump Jesus, asking, okay, God, out of the 600 commands, which one's the most important? And Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. A second one, though, is equally important. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on those two commands. Then I like to go, what were his last words? I think last words matter, but his last words on earth as he talked to his disciples is often kind of referred to as the Great Commission and follow along in Matthew 28. These are the things that Jesus said, this is what you're to do. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new, disi teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always to the very end of the age. As you are going, there's a really a better translation. Sometimes people confuse the go as the command. That's not the command. The command is make disciples. It's more like assumed you're already traveling. You're already going. No amount of skill level or age is mentioned at all, which I think is really interesting. You could be two or you could be 92, and the command is still the same. A fun side note, most of the disciples probably were around the age of 16 to 26 year old. It's kind of interesting to think about who Jesus' guys would have been. But then you see in Acts 1.8, right as he's about to go back into heaven, he states this. In Acts 1.8, says, But you will receive power... When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Basically saying, you shall be my witnesses. And as Chris mentioned in previous weeks, be my witnesses sent out as heralds of the King, telling others that Jesus is Lord and already in His throne. In Jerusalem, and in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Last words matter. What would you want your last words to be if you were going to die today? Or, maybe a little less morbid thought, what important words would you write in your kid's graduation card? What are the things that you would want to impress upon them? Last words matter. As we go, we are not only told to declare who's on the throne as the heralds, but we are commanded to be making disciples. Start the process of reproduction. Now, Chris and Esther with 16 kids seem to have mastered that idea, but you can watch his last sermon for more on that. But for some reason... We tend to overcomplicate this command of making disciples, and we get nervous thinking, I can't build relationships, and I don't have all the answers, like we'll ever have all the answers. But one thing I do know, we naturally talk about the things that are important to us. We talk about our favorite songs, we talk about our favorite ice creams, our favorite chicken sandwich, Chick-fil-A, we talk about athletes, 
We talk about cute boys. We talk about cars. We talk, you fill in the blank. You get the idea. What you talk about is what's important to you. We all wish we were better. We all wish we knew more, etc. Yet the real reality is we can't just try harder. We must begin training. Just like anything else we want to get better at. But how do we do that really? Lately, Chris and I have had, a, and a few others, have had a lot of interesting conversations wrestling through some really big ideas and acts. Chris has already mentioned that he and I keep coming up with questions and issues that we want Jesus to clarify for us when we get to speak with him face to face. And the thing I really love about Chris is his willingness to sit and think and chew on stuff and even, even banter back and forth. And yet at the same time, we can extend grace to each other knowing that we're both really on the same side, just trying our best to figure out loving God and loving people in this context. However, a little mystery as to what God's up to and a sense of dependence on the Holy Spirit to guide us in a little wrestling together, figuring stuff out, is really healthy. Honestly, it seems to be very similar to the tensions that were present in Acts 2. Think about what must have been happening in there. Think of all the scratching of heads the disciples must have been going through. And, and now all of a sudden the Spirit shows up and 3,000 people are added. Oh my. Think about that. Interesting side note, if you haven't been following the Chosen series on TV or on the app or whatever... They do a fantastic job of drawing out and sewing some of the wrestling that the journey of the disciples went through. Um, you ought to really check that out. It's pretty interesting. But one of the things that gets me really excited is to look at all our various differences among our church family and then to identify our various strengths and to, various, and to connect the dots and move forward together in a common strategy to accomplish big things like eternal things. My strengths lie in belief, empathy or intuition, um, connector, as you might see me trying to tie into Chris's sermons, um, developer and relator. Those are the things that like I function best at. My, my mind works in big picture, long-term planning, training, strategically, purposefully, and sometimes slowly. Chris's mind works as more in a moment and goes deep and a little bit more free-flowing reading books at double speed. And is much more spontaneous and adaptable. In fact, I was joking with Brett, Brett back there last week as Chris was finalizing things for the service that was just about to take place. I'm writing notes to myself worrying about next week's sermon. It's, and it's not a right or wrong thing. And honestly, I have to work at being a little more flexible and adaptable and, and relaxing a little bit. It's one of the many ways that we complement each other so well and why he asked me to talk this week about the transition that we begin to see in Acts and some of the disciples' changes and this new thing all of a sudden that's called church. Chris and I have different styles and giftings, but we share the same love and unity for God's people and each other. And that's super exciting. God has made all of us unique and all with a purpose. So let's look at the text in Acts again. Let's begin our new adventure with some questions that must have been rolling around in the early church. Some questions like, what does it mean to grow spiritually? Is ministry caught or is it taught? What is the transitional journey of total evil to being in the image of Christ look like? What are some of the hurdles to overcome that people have to face in that journey? Now, we don't have time to answer all of these questions now, but I do want you to think about them a little bit. Big questions, I know. How about a few more? What should the church look like? What does church even mean? What's the purpose? How does it fit in in our life journey together? Is it mandatory? Can church be a group of friends and believers at work? Can church be mothers getting together, get coffee together? What about can church be working out in a gym together? What about auto mechanics, musicians, plumbers, teachers, first responders, etc. Coming together, helping needy folks. Is that church? I think the answer is yes to all of those. 
But I also know one thing is that we all long for, and that is to be to know and be known. Every one of us longs to know and be known. We all long for true community and real relationships at a gut level. The inherent need for community is modeled in the eternal Godhead. If you remember in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Like, perfect unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has always been. And out of that perfect community, out of that perfect love began creation. We are hardwired for community. We are hardwired to know and be known. Yet community is kind of an interesting concept, especially in our highly individualistic culture, where walls get built and often confused with the language of boundaries. Throughout history and in many parts of the world, they share and do life way differently than we do. It's often much more communal than we do in our entitled individual world, where we often erect walls, gates, lock doors, keep people at a distance, all the while longing to connect, know, and be known. As you reread Acts 2, 42-47 this week, I'd really encourage you, read it and read it and see what they did out of the overflow of love. In the context of learning, eating together, praying together, flowed life together. They didn't have a fully developed doctrine yet, as if we ever do, but they were learning together and shared what they knew and everything they owned with others out of the overflow of their heart. So how do we do this? Where do we start? Can I, can we ever get or have what my soul really craves? Well, we got to start somewhere, and God has already been working on it. Every one of us in his own unique way and even those God has placed around us, not in condemnation, but with mercy, grace, and truth. Out of the overflow of love, 3,000 were added. Think about how diverse a group that suddenly became with all the different ages, races, nationalities, economics, skills, jobs, etc. But it's interesting, why the number 3,000? It's interesting to think about. Chris talked about some of the connections between Moses on Mount Sinai and Pentecost. Moses came down and suddenly 3,000 were killed. The law revealed and brought death, but the Spirit brings life. And in Acts, we see 3,000 people came into a loving encounter and seemingly were unified as one almost instantaneously. Numbers and connections in Scripture can be really kind of fun, honestly. And I don't think they're incidental. What about the story of the 12-year-old child dying and the woman bleeding for 12 years who stops Jesus on the way of him going to heal or raise the 12-year-old? She had been bleeding since the time the kid was born. Kind of a crazy connection. However, 12 has a lot of connections in Israel. Jesus had 12. Why 12? Chris and I were bantering about 12 one day. And he focused on Jesus coming as a prophesied king, uniting the 12 tribes. I was like, fair enough. I tend to think Jesus chose 12 guys after praying all night with the Spirit because he wanted to model something, something that we could all do. Being available to the masses, intentionally investing in 12 three and doing life with one as we are bantering back and forth about it a little bit it kind of dawned on me that maybe god is so big and actually has things so figured out that he could have orchestrated all of the above so there's a weird tension that develops here i think some see jesus not as having a plan or a strategy but that he kind of just wandered through the land being perfectly who he was now admittedly He was fully God, and He was so dependent and directed by the Spirit and perfect that He just oozed ministry in God's heart. But you see multiple times where He acted 
maybe in his full humanness and or godness, in very purposeful ways. For instance, the raising of Lazarus. He knew and he let him die. And he even told his guys that. He said they, that they would see the glory of the Son of God. He was intentionally, purposefully teaching, modeling, relational disciple-making principles that we have to kind of look at and dig in a little bit and contextualize as the disciples became a church and the story of God kind of continued. It's funny in some ways because we all, churches too, have a liturgy or a way or a strategy that we do things. The question to wrestle with is what and why do we do the things we do? What's the purpose or the plan? For example, why Sunday mornings at 1030? Why churches meet on Saturday nights? What kind of building do you want to have? A band? A live stream? A children's program? A youth ministry? These are all good things, but they're providing some sort of structure for a reason. Something to accomplish something. And I think the question that begins to arrive is, are they facilitating true community? Well, hopefully. And really, this last year during our COVID epidemic or pandemic, or however we want to describe it, has actually caused a lot of many church leaders and people to stop and really think more about some of those things. So how should the church function? Is it really about my wants and desires and what's popular in a culture at a given point? Like how good the performance is? Is it really church if I don't engage and am not welcoming people and making an effort to know and be known? Isn't that really what my heart craves down deep? Do we meet to just keep learning and learning and learning? What about celebration? What about adoration, confession, encouragement, prayer, listening to each other? What about hugs? And oh, of course, eating together too. You see much of that in Acts. And it's as they encountered their need of a Savior and confessed and celebrated in their newfound hope, they began to share and reproduce, and it was magnetic. Hopefully, as we continue to grow, that it is similar, and we're going, that it's maybe, maybe another way to think about it is, it's like going to the hospital to get healed and sent back out to be about the great everyday commission of loving people who need a doctor as well. Interestingly, if you ever want to get to know the structure or priorities and or values of a church or any organization for that matter, look at the budget. It's tr is it truly reflective of empowering relationships? Be careful, though. We don't want to get to judging too harshly because the same thing could be said about our own budgets. But here's where I think it gets really exciting to look at Acts 2 and to look at the possibilities that I see here at Open Table. And this is where I, I, get, I start getting goosebumps here because... They were sharing everything and they were using their own unique gifts and passions. Not communism, but they voluntarily and giving out of the overflow of their love a way of almost subverting our secular and individualistic culture. They sold their stuff to be able to help others in need because they loved God and they loved people. And they viewed this life as temporary. They began their journey of trust and of true community by spending time in confession, in forgiveness, reconciliation, and prayer. Now that takes a lot of relational time to develop. But let's begin a journey towards it, because we need it. We crave it to know and be fully known. Then they were genuinely liked by all the people. We don't need a marketing firm or some campaign. We need studying, praying, serving, and loving. Not only in words, but in actions. And being a sharing kind of people. That is what's magnetic. That's what you saw in Acts, and that's why people came. What you attract people with is what you will keep people with. That's a tricky thing. Let us be about love. 
Remember, though, no matter what amount of farming we do, God does the growing. Out of the roots of the abundance of transforming love come some really exciting fruits in His timing. So let's, take, let's start by taking what we've been reading about and see, see a few principles we can transfer to our modern context. These are going to be some essential foundational principles that I think are, are almost necessary for family life health. I have it kind of broken out in two areas. Love God and love others. You see a prayerful dependence, a communication of the Word and proper concept of Christ. You also see an atmosphere of love, a biblical group image, and a consistent contacting ministry. These, I believe, are foundational to life, to ministry, and frankly, all ministry structure. And I'm not going to be able to spend a ton of time now, but what do I mean by all these things? Well, I'm glad you asked. Atmosphere of love, simply put, do people feel welcomed, encouraged? And are, they, and are we genuinely interested in people? Do we, do we remember birthdays and other important details about people? It's been said that true compassion is love that goes beyond the point of convenience or comfort. Pastor Chris and Esther and even the kids have modeled that to me recently and to all of us, and we should be thankful for them. Secondly, you see this idea of reading and using our Bibles like it was God's very Word. It's interesting, I, I mentioned this illustration to the kids the other night, is it's like God's text message to us. And I actually thought about trying to send out a church-wide text message just to see who would check it in the middle of the sermon. Because isn't it true that like whenever we get the little ding, we instantly check it. I sometimes wish we had that enthusiasm for God's Word. Growing in our understanding and love of Christ as He revealed Himself. Dependent and directed by prayer. Do we treat God like our cosmic prayer genie? Or do we spend time listening to God? And there's a lot of different tools and apps I could share if you want. Maybe a Maybe this idea, I think, is something we ought to consider. A prayer small group that prays for Sunday mornings, that prays for our children, that prays for our youth. Just an idea. A group image that you see up there. The idea of being set apart, being holy, being something different. That kind of people that people wonder about in a positive way. How do people in the community talk about us? Next, you see contacting and the idea of intentionally getting out and building relationships with people on their turf. Again, you see in John 1.14 where Jesus came and dwelt among us. But the idea is that God came and pitched His tent among us. He came and camped in Wellsville. Are we going to be about getting out on people's turf and getting to know them? These foundations ought to be part of every ministry segment of the church. They're some of the greatest unifying things that I so appreciate about Pastor Chris and his heart for God, his heart for God's Word, and his heart for people. As we look at Jesus' journey of ministry and foundational priorities and relationships with the Twelve, He's called and commanded us to do the same thing. Relationships that are all around us for a reason. In fact, maybe another way to think about this, Jesus loves the people around you so much that He gave them you. It all begins and ends with relationships. In fact, it's been said by Oswald Chambers, he says, the main thing about Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship that we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. That is all God asks us to look after. And it's the one thing that is continually being assailed. Maybe another way to look at it is Howard Hendricks says it this way, you can impress people from a distance, but you can only impact them up close. 
The principle basically is this. The closer the relationship, the greater the chance for deeper impact. We know this intuitively. But are we meeting regularly to invest in those relationships? Are we too busy even doing good things? Are we intentionally engaging in relationships? The sad thing is, or the challenging thing is, intentionally engaging in relationships will be the hardest work that you will ever do. Relationships are hard work. Relationships can be a real struggle. And honestly, that, that struggle is a part of the fall. And I long for the day when that will no longer be the case. And I long for the day wondering what the heck that's going to look like. But we'll worry about that at some other point. But as we move forward, making disciples is Jesus' commands. And as a command of Jesus to be making disciples, I think there's a fair question that we should be able to ask each other. What is the name of the person who is investing or discipling you? And who are you currently discipling? It's a command. It's not, an, it's not like Jesus said, hey, I got a good idea. You ought to think about this. It was a command of Christ. And I want you to kind of keep in mind, here's the challenge. Sometimes we come to church and we go, oh, the pastor is the one who disciples me. Well, let's be fair to Chris. We can't all claim Chris is our discipler. He'll never get anything done. That's unfair to him. Which I think, is, again, is part of the genius of Jesus modeling to us and the ex expectation that he had as he left. And he basically said to his disciples, okay, your turn, go do it. We need to be about the work and investing in leadership and about each other. Yet as we engage this mission Jesus gave us, each of our journeys is going to look different. Because we all have different passions. We all have different abilities and giftings. And frankly, we all connect differently with different folks. But we it ought to be able to ask each other, and we should all have names, if we claim to be followers of Christ. What are the names of unbelievers here in Wellsville, or your workplace, or school, that would call you a friend? Jesus loves your co-workers so much, He gave them you. We're to be about sharing the hope. So as we look at these texts and others and think through relational ministry, I want to talk a little bit about small groups and where they fit. They are a tool to help facilitate relationships. They're not the only tool, but they are a pretty good one. I don't want to create lots more groups and programs and stuff. And there's always a balancing act. But with our foundations as essential, let's kind of focus on a bit of a strategy. Again, I'd love to spend a lot more time to fully unpack this. But I think for the moment we can see some patterns with Christ's model of ministry. One big question that I've, I have always kind of wrestled with, with God being all-knowing, all-powerful and with unlimited resources, why did he choose to model what he did? God doesn't need anything, but he wants us and wants to have us join him and use us to make a difference. Maybe part of the answer lies in the Hebrew history of the 12 tribes of Israel, but as I shared before, I tend to think it's a bit more of a practical reason as well. We can do it. Every one of us can invest in 12, in 3, and do life with 1, and help them reproduce likewise. Simple exponential math tells you that if we all did it and expected the same, it would be world-altering very quickly. Yet our world doesn't seem to be getting much better, does it? And for whatever reason, we often neglect the very model that Christ gave us. We like to engage in more programs, more events, more marketing. And we almost forget that being intentional with relationships that are already immediately around us. 
So as we come to church and go about life, are we going to be spectators or participants? Remember Pastor Chris shared last time, we're all called to be the kingdom of priests. In Exodus 19 and Genesis 22, the idea that God has called us and given us a role. Jesus showed himself as king, commanding us to love him and people, and gave us a mission, a purpose for our lives to be about. And then gave us the Holy Spirit and his power to carry it out and to bless the world in our unique giftings and personalities. So how am I, how are you, how are we blessing the world? As we begin to move forward and as a church family, we need to be growing and equipping to enable us to be better reaching out. It's where most churches kind of get that order backwards. We want, oftentimes you see in churches that they want to win the masses and then they have an O, oh, fill in the four letter word of choice moment and state, what the heck are we going to do now? We've got all these people. Instead of naturally equipping people to love and share and having a healthy family foundation to bring our lost and new believing friends where they can be nurtured to health. Think of it maybe this way. It's much like an ambulance driver going, getting the hurt and dying and bringing them back to the great physician and his caring team of nurses. If you don't have the caring team of nurses, you got a problem. It's also the area that's the hardest to grow in and balance because we naturally gravitate towards being more comfortable with more events. Some like doing more and more Bible studies, growth level things, getting more filled and more comfortable with our own little cozy group. I've even heard some pastors say that people should be at church every night of the week. But if you remember, that was part of the problem that Jesus was addressing when he left, forcing them to think about, oh man, What's next in our world? I'm not sure the Western church doesn't need a little more persecution to cause it to rethink and realign priorities to Jesus' mission. I often feel or fear that we're too comfortable. We're too cozy. We need to be filled up, but we need to be pouring out. We need to be growing and serving and investing and eventually being trained to reproduce in others. We'll always have to continue to grow in those foundational areas that I mentioned before. So again, what are we traveling towards and how can we help others get there? Not just an eternal destination, but real life, real hope, real love right now. The idea of small groups can be a place where we can help each other grow and spur on to be personally investing in. I don't think, I do think it includes those in our own families as well. In fact, I think it honestly starts there. Small groups of 8 to 15 people. And in Chris and Esther's case, they need two or three small groups in their own house. Small groups of people getting together, essentially little churches modeling Acts 2, who then come together to celebrate with the whole family on the weekends. Now small groups, they're not... They're not just to play and drink coffee, although Jesus might have, but to dig in, to study Scripture, to share, to pray, and hopefully eat some too. It all begins with the Gospel and understanding our own need of a Savior. Then to begin the journey of trusting, to know and be known by spending time confessing, repenting, while extending mercy and grace, forgiveness and reconciliation. That only comes in the context of trusted relationships. And that takes time to develop. As we grow more in our understanding of love of, for God and others, we can't help but be motivated to gather and share. To go back out reproducing through the Spirit's help. So why small groups as the tool to help develop disciple making? Well, one, I believe it's a safe place to begin to develop relationships and trust And be known and actually experience the love of God's mercy and grace together. But two, it's also a safe place to grow and begin to influence. Remember, God loved and met us where we were. But he also loved us enough not to leave us there. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for us together. We need little shepherds. 
We need shepherds over segments of the flock to model and spur on disciple making and to share the responsibilities to develop and take care of the larger family. It's part of the leadership development. Remember, we're a kingdom of priests, as Chris mentioned. We're all ministers in our various circles of influence. It's not Chris's church or his job to convert Wellsville. Sure, he's God's appointed leader for us, and we need to be praying for him constantly. But it's our job, at least to be involved in the process of the Spirit drawing people. And we have people in our everyday lives to love and share the good news with. So what do we do with this? Where are you? Which direction are you moving on the journey of total evil to total Christ-like? How are you helping or modeling to your kids? How are you helping others? Maybe some what-ifs to ponder. I like big things to ponder. Be thinking of principles of relationships and investing, though. But what if we reached out? What if we were known as caring friends with unbelievers? What if in the future we built a building to host family meals or sports practices for the purpose of blessing Wellsville and being a relational bridge? Maybe you're like, oh, oh that's, that's way overwhelming. We need to start smaller. What if we build a sand volleyball court? What if we build a pavilion with grills or a fire pit for friends to sit around? What if a small outdoor basketball court? Or what about a small outdoor fitness trail that all the truckers parked outside our door could use? Like these big ideas, they come out of a real story. Chris and I were sitting around the dinner table one night and the little ring doorbell thing went off and like there was a trucker sitting on our patio doing push-ups. <laughs> and we were kind of laughing about it, but I'm like, it just gave me this idea. All ideas of have, helping people in our everyday lives share the good news with. All ideas of thinking of relationships and connecting and building community in our community. I can get even crazier, maybe a small pond. Now you're thinking, wait, 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 whoa, Reg, what's up? Think for a second about dads and sons and grandpas and other older men in the church or community coming together and fishing a pond Think about the idea of the older men having some worth and purpose now as they invest in some younger guys. Now, admittedly, I'm not saying we need to do all these things this week. And to be honest, I struggle because I'd rather urge us to be out in the community building relationships. But if we can be a blessing to those hundreds of truckers sitting right outside our doorstep, literally, and use our facilities, our resources to be a tool for building relationships among families in the community, then I think we need to start thinking and praying now. What if we partnered with a truck stop? And I know that just probably like, what, who, who, what church partners with a truck stop? Maybe even with an inner city ministry, which we already do. But what does it look like for a church family to love people that may never become a member of the local church, but might actually spread the gospel kingdom through other parts of the world? Those are big questions. Some of you are probably asking, oh my gosh, how'd this Reg guy come up with all this? And wondering how in the world we're going to pay for it. And probably are getting a little nervous, thinking, are you going to start asking for money? No, I'm not. In fact, it honestly makes my stomach turn in a lot of ways. You don't have to worry about it because I'm not a big fan of marketing campaigns. But I do believe if there's a vision for reproducing love affair with God and an unconditional love for people, God shows up. Remember, we all have various gifts and talents and abilities to serve and to give out of the overflow of love. And that includes gifts of making and giving money as well. 
fact, I remember a story, a former student of mine sat down and we were talking and he said, I don't know if I should become a youth pastor or an airline pilot. And the response a friend of mine and I gave him was that God needs airline pilots just as he does youth pastors. Funny thing is, (laughs) currently, he's neither. He's a business guy who happens to be a great friend and a great thinker. And God has blessed him with a high-paying job and serves on a relational disciple-making board alongside me. And he honestly uses his money to bless others like none other. It's pretty cool. But what if we started an auto mechanics ministry to help widows in our community? What if we adopted kids or helped families adopt kids or international exchange students for the purpose of raising them in God-loving families? I want to encourage us to start praying and thinking of intentional building of relationships inside and outside the church as we go about our everyday God-given talents and interests. Being intentional about investing in people doesn't always mean coming to the church and doing some sort of Bible study, although knowing and learning Scripture is vitally important. But maybe, just maybe, You do something really spiritual like meet at McDonald's or meet at Burt's Truck Stop. Maybe taking someone with you shopping. Maybe working on your car together and talking over life and the Holy Spirit's work in your life. So where do we go from here? Well, a great time to reflect is always at funerals, other milestone events, and when you have your own kids because we all want what's best for them. Yet whatever life stage you're at, I want us to wrestle with what's your next step in the journey. Is it to attend regularly? Is it to get involved? Is it to be part of a small group? Maybe it's to be serving different areas of the church. I know the youth need more volunteers. What about cleaning or being part of the liturgy or helping with sound or the band Or part of a creative team. Maybe starting a prayer ministry. Maybe maybe using a gift that we don't even have yet. We need that too. Maybe even financially. Sell something to help someone. Start intentionally investing in those around you. Getting to know some non-believers. And build relationships. And just naturally share your life. Maybe some of you are nervous to get involved because trust doesn't come easily for whatever past reasons. I get that. Unfortunately, I really get that. But can I urge you to try again? Maybe some of you are nervous to host or lead a group because you've never done it before. It feels like a lot of responsibility to lead something. Don't worry. We'll go slow. We'll train you. And besides, a little nerves is a good thing. Honestly, I'm just praying I was faithful to God and His Word and didn't screw you up with the sermon. So I keep reminding myself that there is always hope. As Gandalf said, who was part of my college ministry, I guess, there is always hope. And I really believe we have a great family here. And that, and that God really is up to something special among and through us. So a practical first step, I think we can all do starting this afternoon. We can start praying for Chris and Esther. They're a great, they are a great couple and they deal with a lot of pressure that frankly most of us don't know anything about. If being a pastor won't cause you to occasionally cuss, I'm not sure I know something that will. <laughs> Secondly, pray asking God how you are to lead and to contribute to community here at Open Table and beyond. Start praying. Start asking that question. Prayer has been said to be the nerve that moves the muscles of an all-powerful God. And I love the idea when people start praying for people, God moves. If you're interested in hosting and or helping facilitate a small group to dig into Scripture, to confess, to encourage and pray for each other and maybe eat some too, let Chris and I know. 
We're going to start meeting with leaders and hosts this summer as we begin to work towards putting groups together and kind of figuring out how it's supposed to work towards the end of the series. We'll get you the resources. We already have some ideas. But how we put things together largely depends on how you and your desire to grow and to be more actively engaged to reproduce ourselves and impact Wellsville and beyond. It really is all about relationships. Whatever programs, whatever events, whatever structures that we come up with, it always has to be about facilitating relationships. It's all about a day-to-day reality of relationships, not a once-a-week thing. So let me conclude with this one last story that's really been on my mind a lot lately. Two friends of mine at the church I was at, Corey and Shanna, started an athletic club, a gym, and as they were beginning this thing, they started in the church gym. I joined to support them, trying to invest and get out in the community and build some relationships with non-churchy folk, and to try and stay in good enough shape to keep up with the students, frankly, especially as we were headed to an outdoor adventure camp in Colorado. Yet the more time I spent with Corey and Shanna, the more I began to see it as a ministry, and that is an extension of who they were. We had many hours of talking, actually me listening, right, Corey? And talking over the similarities of being in leadership, pastoral leadership, and frankly, owning your own business. We had a lot of ups and downs and a lot of coffee. But Legacy Gym began to develop its own community family. And Corey and Shanna didn't back away from their faith. After 10 years in the making, they actually started having a small group Bible study. And most of the attendees were from the gym. It was a collision of intentionality and purpose and natural organic growth because of who they were. It was such a cool thing to see how they left a legacy that really did affect an entire community. They sold it here recently and they moved to Florida last week and it was a very tearful goodbye. It was sad to see them leave, but the tears were also in celebrating a job well done. And God was honored. And I can't wait to see how God will use them next in building relationships and investing in people in their own unique giftings and personalities. Now, we're not going to get fully transformed overnight or by trying harder, but by training and doing it alongside people and family, just like Legacy Jim, leaving our own legacy. So maybe one last way to think through all this is the analogy of parenting. As parents, we all want our kids to succeed in life. And thus, we're about growth and equipping them to send our kids out to reproduce other healthy reproducing families. The Father commanded it back in Genesis. He modeled it and commanded it again in the Everyday Great Commission. And He gave us the Holy Spirit with the power to change and guide us in moving forward again. So as we move forward... What will our disciple-making family tree look like? Did we, will we invest in such a way that our family tree has branches to reproduce and reproduce, affecting eternity? We're all on this journey. We've all had that crib we fell out of at some point in our life. And community comes through being on mission together like a band of brothers. As we embark on this journey, let us encourage and spur each other on to keep relationally making disciples and be honest and vulnerable enough to know and be known in all our strengths and failures and to extend grace and mercy to a dying world around us. Every time we walk out this church, we ought to see those trucks sitting out in front of us and be reminded it's not just them that's traveling, it's all of us. Can we be Rivendell? Can we be the rest for the weary, the hospital, the nurse, and to send back out? Let's start our legacy today. So as we conclude, conclude, let's pause and pray and spend time remembering that we all have a story and that it connects to a much grander story because Christ did it for and modeled for us by coming to the table. During His last Passover meal, 
He gave up his rights and began serving and extending mercy, grace, and a hope that passes all understanding. And so the story of relationships continue. Join us.